and welcome to Need to Know, your weekly investment podcast brought to you by the experts at Coots. I'm Sarah Muir and I'm joined as always by Alan Higgins for a look at what investors need to know, not just for the week ahead, but some broader topics as well. And certainly we're looking at some broader topics today. Before we get to that, though, Alan, um, we had a few messages in from listeners to the podcast. We had James Butterfield getting in touch with us, didn't we? So those of you that are regular listeners will have remembered James. He's from CoinShares. He came on to talk about Bitcoin a couple of weeks ago. And of course, I don't have the date in front of me of when that podcast was. But yeah, what, what he had some interesting points to make in relation to the podcast we did last week with Emily Serrado from Christie's, didn't he? Yeah, well, he's he's our resident crypto bro, isn't he? That's <laughs> yes. what they call themselves, isn't he? Um, and <laughs> as a reminder, he used to be head of equity strategy at uh, Coots many years ago, even working for me, would you believe? And he became a crypto bro. But yeah, because... One of the big things that he's been talking, because I challenged him and I said, Bitcoin in particular is a belief system. And he, he, he came back strongly. There's there's lots of belief systems out there. Gold, he mentioned. Mm. And he was so pleased to hear Emily. You <laughs> yes. heard it directly. Because when I challenged Emily, then said, well, you know, isn't R a belief system? She, she actually said, yes, absolutely. Um, so James is delighted. And he wrote us a very long note, didn't he? He did. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had a chance to read it all through yet, but I'm sure we'll be getting James back on again in the future. But just for those of you that didn't hear last week's um, Need to Know, we did have as a special guest, Amelie Serrado from Christie's. Fascinating discussion, talking about art as a store of wealth. I mean, she slightly pushed back against the concept of art as an investment, which I think we both kind of agreed with, didn't we? But it was really interesting about what's been happening in the last 10 years in art markets, what the future holds, what's happening in sort of on the kind of immediate horizon and some of the trends in, in the art market. And it was really, really fascinating. So do have a listen to that. Um, and the other one was we had, because we talked- Sarah, so I have to stop you there because yeah. before we go there, James in his long <laughs> email uh, mentioned surfing again. He did. Our That's listeners are obsessed with surfing. What's going on? <laughs> and ju- just because he, he mentioned something and somebody else mentioned it, there's some kind of artificial surfing in Bristol that people can do. There is. It's, I think it's I believe it's called the wave. It was when I was living in Bristol. It was they just about opened it. I haven't been there. It looks pretty amazing. It's very futuristic. Um, I haven't been. If anyone has been and you can report on it. But apparently it's very, very good. I mean, well, I don't know. What James, James has. He says it's very, it's very good, but he's banging on okay. about um, <laughs> about Cornwall again. But big news is I found a mm. surfing expert. Brilliant. So maybe <laughs> just for five minutes or so, if you indulge us, yeah. we're going to give the top three official places to surf in the UK. Okay. I don't think we'll go Europe wide. We'll, we'll do that in months to come. But <laughs> officially, the top three places coming. Brilliant. Yes, exactly. Thank you for reminding me about that. Now, the other one that we heard from, we heard from our um, Swedish, uh, a Swedish listener. I'm sure we've got more than one listener in Sweden. That's Chris. Uh, and because we, we talked quite a while ago, actually, now we talked about the Beyonce blip and Swiftonomics and things like that, and the impact that Taylor Swift was having on uh, inflation. And it really is that there is certainly sort of hyperinflation, I would say, in Sweden as a result of Taylor Swift, isn't there? Yeah, so I think the first one, um, so Sweden's had higher inflation in the UK. We know UK has been more inflation prone. And I'm pretty sure it was Danske Bank that came out that blamed higher Swedish inflation on it was Beyonce, I think, wasn't it, who started her yeah. co- concert in Sweden, and everyone wanted to go to the first one in Stockholm, wonderful city, of course. And hotel prices, restaurant prices went through the roof. And now I believe I'm not a Swifty, but I believe Taylor Swift is starting a, co- a, a European leg of a, a of a concerts in Stockholm. Mm. And um, he kind of he was complaining about hotel prices. Did you pick any up from him? I did, yeah. I think there were he gave an example of a room, and I can't remember what the size of the room was, but the week before the weekend before Taylor Swift arrives, it would be in sterling terms, £360 a night. And I think if you were going to stay there the night of uh the opening night for Taylor Swift, it would be two thousand six hundred pounds. That's inflation. It's inflation. And also, you know, one of the themes, the running themes we've had for 18 months is GDP data nearly always is revised upwards, especially in Europe. These sort of effects, um, which eventually filter through all the knock on effects in the the service sector. Yeah. um, 
So let's see. I'm gonna we're gonna keep a close eye on Swedish inflation over the next couple of months. Definitely. And if anybody else listening has got any um, insights on surfing or inflation or Taylor Swift, please send them in to me, sarah.muir at coots.com, or you can get in touch with Alan or myself on LinkedIn. Um, all right, then we are going to talk this week about bubbles, aren't we? We've got a sort of overriding theme and we split it into sort of three different sections. So what is it we want to sort of how are we going to tackle bubbles then? Well, I think we we, we start um, by, yes, bubbles. Why? I, I should say a um, mm. couple of reasons. One, The Economist, always a good source. And yeah. some people have even said this is a contrarian indicator. So on the cover, now not in the UK, if you're an economist reader in the UK, you've got some rubbish about build a British voter. I'm looking at it right now. But globally, they've basically gone from a, for, for a bubble-like picture of a bull being lifted by hot air. And I'm reading that as I read out, share prices, problems on the horizon. Um, you know, I hate to knock the economist, but also on Bloomberg, some of the col- columnists there, l- yeah. the likes of John Arthur is very strong. They, I mean, look, these are great writers and great mm. analysts, but I thought, right, okay, bubbles. But the issue is um, there is no standard definition of a bubble. You know there's a standard definition of a bear market, don't you, Sarah? Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. So Don't ask minus, me to repeat it because I can't remember. Minus 20. I'll help you out. Minus yes, 20. Thank you very much. Minus 20 is a st- kind of industry standard accepted definition of a bear market. Yeah. When it comes to bubble, there is no definition. You know, is it something okay. up five times, eight times, 10 times? So a uh, bit of a judgment call. But I did ask you because I knew you'd mm-hmm. be interested. So mm-hmm. in terms of our three things, for you to do the historical yes. bubble analysis, if you like. Yeah. Um, what did you look at? I looked at tulip mania, I, aka I think that's, the, I think that's the Dutch tulip bubble, which is which so, is supposedly the first one. First yes, ever we got that. Bubble. I think we should look at what is the evidence that right now is a bubble, and the Economist yeah. is right. Mm-hmm. And then, arguably, again, judgment call bubbles in my career. So those are the three things I think we should go. Okay, okay. So essentially, then, what is a bubble? It, before we even get started, there is no clear definition. That's what we're saying. There isn't a mathematical that, as you say, it's five times, it's 10 times, it's 12 times. It, it By nature, I guess it is irrational, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. That's, that's a, Actually, that's an interesting point, Sarah. You, you, yeah. it's, but it's, you can say it's irrational in hindsight. Some, right. uh, as, well, actually, it's not fair. Um, sometimes you could say it's irrational in the middle of it. But a lot of the times, only in hindsight, as people get caught up in in it. Um, so let let's see. Where where do you think we should start? Should we start with now and the situation yeah. now, or yeah. and and then history? Yes. And then kind of my experiences. Yeah. Okay. So we've de- we've de- we've established that we can't define what a bubble is. But I noticed. I think J.P. Morgan came out this week. They're talking about Bitcoin surging to record highs. They're saying it risks entering into bubble territory. Lots of talk about the Magnificent Seven, of course. S&P 500 surpassed its 5,000 um, sort of barrier. NASDAQ's record high. Nikkei has gone up again. It's through 40,000 now. So, I mean, lots of people are saying, are we in bubble territory now? Yeah. Um, so let's go through that. Um my answer is no, and 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 don't get me wrong, Sarah. Um, I think we're long overdue a ten percent correction. You know, yeah. um, you know, but impossible to time. And you know, we've done the work. I'll say to you, ten percent correction happens statistically we... every year. Exactly, it's rare we don't have a year with a ten percent correction. The odd year, you know, you know, we're human, so we think in terms of calendar years. Mm. But look. Um, Basically, why um, I don't think it's a bubble, it's not a bubble in terms of share prices, at least, because mm. put simply, it's just about justified by sales and earnings. OK. Uh, and um, everyone's talking about the Magnificent Seven. But I mean, there's a positive sign because stocks within the Magnificent Seven and two in particular that are not delivering on sales and earnings are being sold off right now, especially yeah. Tesla. Yeah. And to a, to a lesser extent, Apple. And if you look, for example, at the poster type of child, NVIDIA, mm. its sales are up 230%. It's yeah. super profitable with strong margins. 
And uh, therefore, if there is a bubble, um, it's a bubble in profitability, okay. which is, you know, not really a, a standard definition of, 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 a, of a bubble. So to, to give you a, a flavor, um, we, you know, it's well, it's been well documented that um, the Magnificent Seven make up just under 30 percent of the U.S. index, mm. but it makes up 22 percent. So getting close to in terms of the overall earnings. Yeah. So it's not as if it, there's a huge weight there based on, you know, fairy dust. It's based on solid earnings. Now, I'm no expert. And actually, one of our listeners, Francesca, was on. And, and uh, yeah, actually, I saw her in the office ask, reminding uh, me that can we get a real expert on AI, which we'll have to do. Yeah, I'm no expert. Um, we do have Howard, of course, who knows NVIDIA much better than we do. And, you know, we're not going to second guess, guess it. But the fact is, the very simple fact, if a stock goes up a lot because of it, its earnings have gone up, it cannot be a bubble unless those earnings reverse. Yeah. And it's fair to say that NVIDIA's sort of multiple versus their earnings has actually gone down from last year, hasn't it? A great point, uh, Sarah. It has, you know, circa 45 times earnings. Mm-hmm. So ironically, you would have been, you know, several years, a couple of years ago, you could have bought it at 45 times earnings, expensive to about 30 times earnings today. Yeah. So um, we should define multiple, don't we? Because we have many new listeners. Yes, we, yeah, we talk uh, about it quite a lot. Yeah. Because we throw multiples around and I'm going to be certainly going to be throwing them around. So just as a reminder, what do these multiples mean? It's one of kind of the industry standard ways of valuing a company. A multiple of 10 times means this. If a company is making one million pounds of profit, obviously we're talking about a super small company, one million mm. pounds of profit. If it's valued at 10 times, it's worth 10 million pounds. If it's valued like NVIDIA at 30 times, that company making one million pounds is valued at 30 million. Yeah. So it's, it's just think multiple of profit, multiple of profit. It's as simple as yeah. that. Yeah. And the, and the other argument for companies like NVIDIA is that they are to all intents and purposes, monopolies, aren't they, as well? So there isn't really anyone to compete with them. Yeah, and it's not all just about NVIDIA. It's also about Microsoft. Mm. I I went to, um, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the rest of the world may catch up, or the the rest of the major companies may catch up, but, um, you know, the likes of Microsoft is performing strongly in terms of sales and earnings growth as well. Uh, The likes of Facebook is coming back for all kinds of different reasons, partly cost control. But, you know, straightforward profitability. So it's not all about AI. You know, Microsoft is an intriguing company. I was talking to someone the other day. I, I was at, sorry, I was at a presentation the other day um, from a fund manager that owns Microsoft. Hmm. And he, he had a really good way of, of kind of explaining it. And he said, right, I'm going to show you a chart here, uh, Sarah. And I'll be, I'm going to show you a chart here of everything that Microsoft has invented. Okay. And do you know what that chart was? blank <laughs> never nothing. invented anything um i don't That's know you, you may you're younger than me but you, you know for example mm. for our older listeners and myself lotus one two three ever remember that the, yeah true. the rings of bell vaguely, in the dim distant past. Spreadsheets. Yeah. yes 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 god oh, yeah. yeah yeah i was doing a whole load of uh, you know stock lending on lotus one two three in fact when i joined coots i brought my lotus one two three files with me but guess what <laughs> IT wouldn't let me use them. We had to use Microsoft. Microsoft Excel took over from Lotus One Two Three. So that's a great yeah. example. Microsoft, yeah. uh, you know, didn't, uh, you know, didn't invent spreadsheets. Somebody else did. Lotus, and there was probably mm. someone even before Lotus. But with their network effects, their business effects, yeah. they they monetize it so well. So it's not all about AI. Uh, and uh, yeah, for um, I, I I still stand by that Lotus One Two Three was better. So, you know, it was so funny bringing Lotus One Two Three in those days floppy disks into, oh into the office at Coots. <laughs> the IT guys, and they were guys, rolled their eyes. Oh God, what have we got here? So, what we're saying then is, in summary, what we're seeing at the moment: markets at all-time highs. Magnificent Seven, well, five of the Magnificent Seven doing really, really, really well. Nvidia earnings, moving markets. It's not a bubble because. The profitability of these companies is is the fundamentals are there essentially is what we're saying exactly and 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 just to round it off it's, to go away from the united states 
sitting here in the UK, you might think, well, what stock market rally? But it's a much broader rally. European mm. stocks are strong, even European banks. Over three years, for example, European banks are outperforming US banks, yeah. including the likes of JP Morgan. JP Morgan is being outperformed by Italian banks right now over three years. And of course, Japanese equities, Sarah, you mentioned Japanese equities. Mm. Um, but Japanese equities are on low multiples, 13 or 14 times earnings. You know, yeah. so so no one, you know, I'm going to give you some examples in a minute of, you know, ridiculous earnings multiples. We're just not there. So, yeah. um, look, 10 um, percent correction. Absolutely. I put my hand up. Yeah. Um, should um, an investor try and do something about it? Absolutely not. Virtually impossible mm. um, to, to call. Um, I, I leave my colleagues at Coots will make the very difficult job of trying to identify that if they even if they try to. But it's really hard. But uh, bubble, yeah. no. Yeah. Okay. All right then. Well, I, I, you you very kindly gave me a bit of homework for a change. So I wanted to before we get on to bubbles in your career because this I believe is a bubble that was a little bit earlier than when you started your career in investment management, um, and it was I believe um, I think it's widely accepted as the first ever asset bubble, um, and that is the Dutch tulip bubble from the 1630s, um, which. It, it, at its peak, the the price for, for tulip bulbs soared something like 20 times and then immediately plunged 99%. It got to a point where the very rarest bulbs that were being traded in sort of private markets in the Netherlands, and I believe they weren't even actually trading the physical bulbs, they were just trading, I guess, futures in the bulbs, um, were you would they would go up for up to a year's salary for a skilled artisan. Uh, in fact, actually, even the most expensive ones went up for 10 times the annual income of a skilled artisan. So I guess that's where you've got that perhaps irrational bubble, because the idea was that people were buying and selling these or buying these bubble uh, bulbs, I should say, in the hope that they would then be able to sell them at a profit. And it got to a point where that wasn't sustainable anymore. And there was an yeah. irrational kind of enthusiasm for these for the for these bulbs. And in the end, it just it collapsed and it collapsed. Quite violently, although interestingly, what I read, I think originally people thought that this did have an impact on the Dutch economy. But subsequently, I think historians have looked and said, actually, it didn't really impact the Dutch economy that much, which is an interesting fact. But that I, I think it is. And um, we can't go back in time. And, and you know, thank you for yeah. saying I wasn't working then. <laughs> um, but... You, you you wonder, you know, what was going through people's minds and, you know, beautiful tu tulips, you know, maybe they can be a store of value. They are unique, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we must be, you know, a little bit humble about because there wasn't much else going on, obviously, in the world uh, then. And um, but, yeah, I've read about it. I think I've read uh, a book, very good book, Extraordinary Delusions of the Popular Mind. Um, which features the, the tulip bubble. Uh, I'm just looking at my bookshelf as we, as we speak to try and find it. Uh, features the tulip bubble, and I have read about it as well. And yeah, that one, not too many people argue that it wasn't a bubble. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it's, and a few people in the early days of crypto have kind of said, well, isn't this like a tulip bubble? Um and, you know, it's an interesting point. We'll have to get James Butterfield on because, you know, tulips are just tulips. But I suppose I go back to actually last last week we covered art. One thing I want to mention, art and Bitcoin have two things in common. They're both mm. priced in dollars. Right. And if, you, if you're in Nigeria where the currency's down, I think, over the last year, 80%. Yeah. The Egyptian pounds just de devalued 40 or 50%. Having a dollar asset is really interesting. Now, pretty hard to own art, except for, you know, the very wealthy um, mm. in, in terms of a standard dollar asset. But that's where Bitcoin comes in. And, you know, maybe it is different. I should say it's a very, we are a very broad church at Coots. We have complete disbelievers. Yeah. Complete believers in everything. And you have someone like me who is willing to consider Bitcoin as network effects brand and can be a, a store of value ironically with great irony because it was meant to compete to the dollar with the dollar with because it's denominated in dollars and it gives yeah. someone a dollar asset yeah okay so 
Again, the only other one I would mention from that sort of prehistory or early period would be in the 18th centuries, we had the South Sea bubble, which was not so much an asset bubble. That was a bubble in, in a company, wasn't it? And that, I believe, was sort of linked to people thought the South Sea was going to be the next East India company. It turned out it wasn't. And I think the, the, the value of the shares surged something like eight times. And then again, that collapsed as well. But perhaps less irrationality there. But definitely, perhaps I think it's reasonable to say that irrationality was, was the key characteristic of, of the Dutch tulip bubble. Which I think that's us- right. Yeah. I think that's right. That's, I, think, I think you've, you've hit, the, Sarah, the exact right word to describe a bubble irrational. No one can describe, going back to what I said earlier, in terms of NVIDIA, Microsoft, Facebook, even Apple. I know Apple's you know, coming off the world as irrational. These are super profitable hmm. companies. Um, yeah. And, you know, things can change, yeah. but it's not irrational, at least. Yeah, exactly. And the fundamentals of those companies, their earnings and their profitability. I think, did I see something like NVIDIA's profitability is like their net profit margin is 70% or something? It's yeah, just, it's, I think it's incredible. you're going to have to get, yeah, it's right. You, need, you should get Howard, our resident US ex, equity expert, on mm. to discuss that. I mean, effectively, it's a, quite a capital light model. Um, mm. because it doesn't have to produce the chips itself. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that's, it's, it, it is worth looking at, but, you know, I'm a bit uncomfortable just focusing on NVIDIA because there is yeah. more to it than that uh, in terms yeah. of, it, t- to be fair, in terms of US stocks. And we mentioned Europe and Japan as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well then let's turn then to where you've identified bubbles in your career. So what, what would be the main ones that you would say? Yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely bubbles. So I'm going to give you three. Mm. Japan, you know, I love talking about Japan. Yeah. Japan, 1980s. Um, yeah. Then I'm going to talk about the late 1990s tech. Mm. And then I'm going to talk about GameStop. Remember GameStop yeah. more recently? Yeah. Uh, so one of the running themes is, as I was looking about this and thinking about it, I actually think it's quite hard to get a bubble in an overall market. It yeah. tends to be in individual stocks and even Japan, which I'll come back to. But GameStop, I had a look at that again, and um, we did a film recommendation. It must be, it's going to, surely it's going to be out on Netflix, Sky, et cetera, et cetera, uh, soon, because it was in yeah. the cinema a year ago or so? It was definitely, uh, yeah. le- so last yeah. year, I think towards yeah. the, I can't remember when it was now, last we, summer, I think. probably. We both enjoyed out. it, didn't we? We Great did, yeah. Fun. Dumb, dumb money. Fun. It's very good. Dumb money, and it, you know, basically how day traders basically closed a hedge fund, you know, virtually. Yeah. Anyway, uh, GameStop went in short order from what uh, basically one dollar mm. to a peak of eighty six dollars, so yes. eighty six times. Yeah, and there were other meme stocks at the time going through the roof as well. Um, and this is the key: an unprofitable company. Yes. So, so GameStop profits are not up 60, 70 times. It remained yeah. unprofitable. Today, it's back at $15. So it's still gone from one to 15, mm. but it's unprofitable still today. And even, you know, looking at analysts who are looking on a forward basis, the PE ratio, so the multiple. So we mentioned NVIDIA 30 mm. times with very yeah. strong profits. GameStop yet to make a profit, but if it does make a profit, 190 times. So why earnings. is it still why is it still at fifteen dollars a share? It's a great question, and and I, I was scratching my head. I think short sellers. So we've covered short selling, haven't we? We and have short covered selling short selling works, and and that's a mm. big feature of the film Dumb Money. Are mm. certainly a bit scared to 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 you know short sell it and find the truth. Mm. There still seems to be a lot of hope built in. Look, uh, look um, this is not a recommendation to sell short or to buy, mm. but I just point out it's, um, as it stands today, a non-profitable company. But to mm. me, that was a bubble. And I think yeah. we did see it at the time, and we even called it at the time. You know, I think we it, called it yeah. crazy because we, we were running the podcast then, weren't we? We were, definitely. I think it was generally accepted then by most people in the industry that it was a bubble. Yeah, ex- yeah. exactly. And... and I mean, some people try to make it a little bit wider and say, therefore, the overall global stock market is also bubble-like, and that's definitely not true. So that's one of my things. So that's number one. Mm. And I think Japan is 
subtle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Japan is um, timely because everyone's talking about it, about the Nikkei. So there's mm. two main indices in, in, in Japan, the Nikkei uh, and the topics. And the Nikkei mm. is not a great index, but, um, and we know that. But um, in the 1980s, it went up by 30% compound over five years. Okay. So but, a, a basically a triple. So 30% yeah. compound, imagine. So, so, but this is the subtlety is that um, it, it went up. Only certain stocks went crazy. Um, right. And I mean, certain stocks absolutely went crazy. And okay, I can get it. I've, 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 I've asked you this before. You have. But I ask you a lot of things yeah. to put you on the spot. <laughs> so um, if, the ja if the Japanese index is basically only just flat topics, the other main index are about flat. Mm. So you've had some dividends along the way. I kind of happen to know that, for example, over these 35 odd years, you've returned 50 odd percent okay. from Japanese equities, including dividends, because there's been okay. dividends along the way. Mm -hmm. If I take a boring company like Toyota, mm. so the total return is 50 percent. What do you think Toyota did okay. in terms of earnings? What would your what would be your your estimate for Toyota? Uh I, I'm I'm just now trying to work out whether this is a leading question or not because I can't remember when the last time you asked me this. I'm going to say 140 percent. 140 percent. Okay. You've made 15 times your money. Sounds good. Toyota. Yeah. Basically, I used to save seven percent compound. I've updated eight percent compound. Okay. Mm. Total return, dividends. Okay. Um, so you've had. US equity type performance from Toyota. And the reason I reference this is that the bubble again in Japan was very specific. It was not in Toyota shares. It wasn't actually in Sony shares. It wasn't uh, in the Honda shares. So, so stuff yeah. that, you know, was sensibly priced absolutely fine. Mm. And it's not as if automakers is um, Apple or Nvidia, right? No. Relatively hard business. So it goes to show. However, okay. So Toyota was on about as and it was quite hard to, to, to find this. Toyota was on about 10 times earnings. Okay. That's so very relevant. But guess what? This was the problem. I'll give you a couple of companies you know, where you may know. Japanese Airlines. Okay. Yeah. 400 times earnings. Yeah, that okay. sounds a little bit. So not, not justified by, by profits. No. Starts to take a huge weight in the index to drag mm. the index down. Went bust. Okay. So it went from 400 times earnings to went bust. Mm. NTT, which is the British Telecom equivalent. Okay. You okay. know, British Telecom, you know, not the easiest business to work. NTT, 250 times earnings. Okay. And then finally, another company that basically was merged away, bust, IBJ, Industrial Bank of Japan, 150 times earnings. So in Japan, there was a, definitely a bubble, but only in certain mm. crazy stocks not justified with profitability. And that gives me, you know, reflecting on today, some encouragement about today because the high weightings of the Magnificent Seven, for example, in the US at 30%, mm. absolutely justified on profitability. In Japan, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, and well, it wouldn't be a need to know if I didn't talk about active-passive. <laughs> um, this is where, as a, as a side note, this is where passive investing went disastrously wrong yeah. because you had huge weights in these terrible stocks and yeah. tiny weights in Toyota and other yeah. sensibly priced stocks. Whereas an active manager saw this and of course overweighted the likes of Toyota. So it can go wrong. So Japan um, is, would, would be what, so Japan and GameStop and then, only to a lesser extent, uh, U.S. technology stocks, the Nasdaq um, mm. in in the nineteen in the nineteen nineties. Because that's the parallel that people are drawing now, aren't they? People who are looking at what we're seeing now, and they're saying, "Is this a dot com bubble two point zero? Yeah, so it is a bit of a parallel. Um, you're right, but um, a couple of stats. Firstly, much more expensive. Mm. Um, I'm just getting my 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 book of earnings out to, to remember much more expensive multiples absolutely um but sales right mm. so 
this is actually quarter four. I think um, the, the last I've already got quarter four in front of me, but the quarter before was even. Uh, so, so the latest quarter was even higher. But sales up two two hundred and thirty percent. Nvidia, mm. and in general, uh, the, the Mag Mag Seven uh, since the last three years um, up up twenty uh, percent sales. Yeah. So this is this is all of them, including Apple and two, including Tesla up to up twenty percent. In contrast. Sales over the couple of years in the in the nineteen nineteen nineties were only eight percent, so yeah. it wasn't. So you had relatively lackluster sales. I'll call, I'm going to call that lackluster, but you had rid, ridiculous multiples. So mm. okay, there was a little bit of sales, so it wasn't as bad as maybe Japan or GameStop. So there was a little bit of sales in there. But you you did have ridiculous multipliers, right? Here we go. AOL, AOL. Did you ever have an AOL password um, email? No, address? I didn't. No, I didn't. I think, I think I did. You know, I think I did have an AOL. <laughs> we were on MySpace too, Alan. What? We Sorry? were on MySpace too, Alan. <laughs> I'm sh- probably not MySpace, <laughs> um, but you know, because I probably rebel. But you know, you needed email. <laughs> AOL, five hundred and thirty-seven times earnings. Right. Okay. Cisco, um, yes. big net. These are good companies. One hundred twenty-eight mm. times earnings, and here's one to bring it home. So today, Microsoft thirty times earnings, yeah, and then seventy-one times earnings. Okay. So ridiculously expensive, yeah, against a background of relatively sluggish sales and profitability. Yeah. In contrast, today, great sales, great yeah. profitability, and somewhat expensive. So mm. look. Um, those, I mean, I'm sure people, yeah, by the way, if people can remember ad- other micro bubbles, I think Taiwan, you know, maybe mm-hmm. from, from memory. I'm, you know, very mm-hmm. happy to have someone on. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are the three bubbles. What, do you, what yeah. do you think, Sarah, when, does it, as you as a, because you always represent our, our, you know, client, our investor, does it make you more comfortable about today when you hear about those bubbles in my experience compared to now? It, it does. But interestingly, the only the other parallel I would draw, and I was having this conversation with a former guest or a, a regular guest on Need to Know Monique Wong, because we went to a client event yesterday. We were chatting about this. And it was the idea that so the dot com boom was all about how the Internet was going to change everything and change the way we lived and change the way we worked. And I guess the only parallel that you could draw is that people are now looking at AI and say it's going to change everything. It's going to change the way we live. And it's going to change the way we work. And. Did the internet really change the way we lived? I guess it did during lockdown, but is AI going to be the same? Is AI really going to change the way we live our lives and the way we do our jobs? Because a lot fair. of this is AI driven. Fair. It's not all AI fair. driven. But it's not AI, AI driven. driven. It's not all AI. That's fair. So again, at least right now, this AI surge that we're having is backed by sales and profitability. Yeah. Now, if the risk is that all completely dissipates. Mm. which is fair and look um that's something i'm going to just h- humbly have to analyze and follow some experts i'm certainly not an expert in the area we'll try and mm. find someone over the next couple of months won't yeah. we to, yeah, to, it, to definitely cover it um definitely. but um yeah ab- ab- absolutely so um i i would argue it's fair i would argue the internet did absolutely change and and it, it improved productivity Mm. um of companies even countries so so i i I would argue um but the fact is it the the mistake the market made is to focus a bit more on the likes of cisco physical network type companies Mm. as opposed to the software now because you can see just from those multiples i gave comparing microsoft and cisco AOL and is that you know the market got got it wrong. Microsoft yeah. was the winner, mm. you know, from that as as Amazon was also obviously the winner over that period. Um, but you just didn't have the sales and profitability to back it up. Yeah. Okay. But here and now you have the sales and profitability. Yes. So in summary, then we're saying a bubbles are hard to define. However, what we're looking at, what we we kind of know when they're not bubbles, or we're arguing that what we're seeing at the moment is not a bubble. Because these sort of huge valuations we're seeing are backed up by fundamentals. They're backed up by profits. 
I think that's I think that's right. And and, um, and the, the subtlety is that it's more common or more skewed to, towards stocks and sectors. I give yeah. the example in Japan, you know, um, people are amazed when I tell them about the performance of Toyota mm. since the, since the peak of the market. So this is since the, the peak of the market was end 89. Yeah. Um, it seems impossible because people are just coming to terms with the fact that, well, isn't the index only just back? To um, current to current to, to 1989 levels. That's true. Yeah, and that's because the index was full of. I nearly said a swear word. We've never said a swear <laughs> word, have we? No. That swear word nearly came out. I'm going to say rubbish instead of the swear word. Um, the Thank index was that. was stacked full of rubbish. Yeah, as opposed to the good stuff. Right now, the because everyone's focused on the US. The US index, yes, it's stuffed full of of stocks they're definitively not rubbish yeah not a recommendation but mm. justified in terms of profitability at least of the, the, the well all of them are profitable but uh, but fast growing profitability and sales yeah okay on that note a reminder that the views expressed in this podcast are not intended to constitute investment advice are accurate at the time of recording and are subject to change Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you, everyone, for listening, for your comments, suggestions, feedback. It is all, as always, very, very welcome. We'll be back next week with more Need to Know. Until then, bye for now.